Welcome back, everybody, to the Home Inspection Whisperer Show. Today, I have Michael Conrad. He is back. The last episode we had together, we talked about client tolerances, lawsuits, and kind of handling complaints uh, from clients. And it was just some normal things, not normal, I hope it's not normal, but it's just some things that we ran into in our business about people complaining and how we had had responded to it. But also at the end of that episode, we talked about starting a series on starting your own home inspection company. Like you wanted Mm. to get in the home inspection business. And the idea that I came up with was, you know, just like anything in the world, before you start a business or before you go in that air, that direction, you always start with a pros and cons list, right? Mm. So we should. Yeah. So I wrote down a bunch of pros and cons, kind of gave you a little bit of homework too about some pros and cons. So you thought about it. And then we're going to break it down on this episode of all the cons to, of home inspecting and the pros. And I found out by building this list, there's actually a lot of cons to be a home inspector. <laughs> Doesn't sound like you maybe did a full pros and cons list when you actually got into this. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I don't think most people did. You know, I was just, I was going through and I was like, okay, well, yeah, that's a con. Yeah, that's a con. Well, that, that could be a pro too. And then I was just like, Oh my goodness, you know, my cons list is actually kind of long. <laughs> then, but of I feel course, like people probably aren't going to do the pros and cons list. So maybe it's just like, just listen to this episode. And if you still want to at the end and you're crazy, then yes. Yes, yes. So after you hear all the cons and it doesn't sound that bad, then yeah, go for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So before I, at the beginning of all these shows, you know, that is our goal is to do the pros and cons list. But I, you know, I always like to kind of do like a small banter talk and, one of the things is that you and I went through the same EDI class to, for stucco and we surrounded ourselves by the same people about getting into the stucco business. Hmm. And, you know, the more I realized of doing stucco, I wonder how much I missed before I actually took those classes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and now I've gotten even in more to stucco and I started doing intrusive drilling and whatnot, but, and it's actually pretty intense, like how bad stucco is, you know? Yeah. And so I did this new build and this new build, what they did is they broke through, they had the stucco up just fine. And then they broke through the stucco and added in this decorative decorative trim around this window. Right. And I'm talking these decorative trim pieces are big. They're like six by sixes cut at a 45 degree angle positioned into the wall, but they did it like literally I'd say less than an eighth of an inch between the window and the outside stucco so they broke all the stucco they broke through the the casing bead they broke the you know the overhead flashing it's all lifted up and pushed back and i mean all they did was just caulk out of it you know like and i was like oh my god i was like this is hideous and so i obviously wrote it up and i actually made it out there before they caulked it so i could actually look between the crack and i could see where the the vapor barrier or the 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 water barrier was tore up and I could see the substrate in there. So the only thing that's keeping water out from hitting that substrate is caulk, you know, and it's not even done very well. So I was describing this and she brought it to the builder and the builder's like, no, no, it's installed just fine. You know, you have a, this is the, the worst thing I always hear builders say is they were like, oh, it has a five to 10 year warranty on the stucco and it's going to be just fine you know if it leaks we'll come back and fix it i'm like no it's going to leak i was like why don't you just fix it now you or you're gonna have to rip it all off and i don't know that how contract works but do you know if like if they use the warranty or the stucco warranty does the builder not have to pay for it or is that like some sort of insurance or does the builder still take care of it yeah so the warranty on these materials is oftentimes not worth the you know weight of the paper that it's printed on yeah. because the truth is the most important part of that warranty is where it says if is it in, if it is installed to the manufacturer's specifications and so this is actually the same thing with roofing it's the same thing with lp siding or hardy all of these material manufacturers have basically the biggest get out of jail free card which is they can say that the builder didn't you know, do it to manufacturer specifications. Now they're actually right most of the time. However, I have heard of them using it when they're wrong <laughs> because it is sort of a get out of jail free card. But effectively, if the builder, the installer, um, specifically in today's construction world, the subcontractor is not installing it correctly, 
you know, there's a bunch of layers of, you know, uh, liability sort of protection that that builder has, which kind of sucks because in my mind, ethically, he is liable if he did it wrong or if he directed someone else to do it wrong or didn't catch it. But yeah, there, there's no one coming to your rescue in those situations if it's all installed wrong. Right. Well, so that's the manufacturer warranty, but then they have these builder warranties or they have a builder where they can go to the builder. So is the builder saying it's a manufacturer warranty or are they saying it's a builder warranty? And if it's the builder warranty, is that some sort of insurance? So the builder's not actually paying for it or is it the warranty company of the builder? paying? Yeah. For so it, there's know? not most of the time, unless it's a huge company like a Dries or something like that. Um, no, it's not like a separate layer of insurance. It's just basically a different word for saying, I guarantee it. You know, they're just saying we guarantee it. And different states have different regulations as far as what the maximum or sort of minimum, um, you know, warranty that a builder has to give. You know, I'm, I'm actually sorry to report that in my state, Tennessee, the builder only has to give a one year warranty. And so they just get off scot free. There's, there's another layer legally, and we're sort of taking this podcast in a different direction, but what's yeah. called a statute of repose, which is effectively the longest time that they're legally liable and they can be brought to suit. Yeah. And so that's four years in Tennessee. I don't know what it is um, it's, in it's, Texas. I know in Mark Parley's neck of the woods over in Iowa, it's like 15 years, which I oh. think is good because it may be a little too much, but I don't know. But it's good because it makes the builders do things right because they know they're going to be on the hook for it. Yeah. You know, that's what I think too. One year is definitely not enough because no. it takes a while. It takes, man, one year just flies by and you're not going to discover most problems within one year, two years, maybe, but maybe not enough damages has occurred. Uh, I believe Texas is four years and it's two years after the state of discovery. So you have four years, but say you discovered it on the first year, then you only have two years after that to file suit. Right. Uh, but I say 15 years is more than fair because your structure should be completely leak free for 15 years minimum. You know, I feel but like it's funny fair. because you're bringing up a really classic scenario. And I think home inspectors are sort of these uh, bystanders for this. A lot of times the customer will be told, oh, hey, it's installed right by the builder. When in reality, that may or may not be true. And I oftentimes don't think the builder actually knows it's almost like an automated answer. Like it just comes out of their mouth before they even know what's being said because in most builders' minds, the client just doesn't know anything. And many times they don't know anything, but they may have equipped themselves with a good home inspector or somebody else. And so they just automatically say, uh, it's fine. And so I, I always tell people like, you want to see a builder lie and get caught in a lie, have the buyer or the homeowner tell them that something is wrong and they'll immediately say it's not and then you can later prove it you know because it's just they they're just so trained to basically say no everything's fine you're just wrong mr home buyer mr homeowner you know though that's really funny you know i and that makes a lot of sense because in texas you actually do not need any license to be a builder you know you can just be a builder Ooh. and one time i was doing this inspection on like this multi-million dollar house and they had this nice tile roof but there was no plumbing jacks on the roof, the tile roof. They just did like this liquid flash on all the plumbing jacks. And I said, that's not right according to the manufacturer standards. And, and then he was like, he was like, how do you know this? And I just gave him the piece of paper from the manufacturer. I'm like, you can't really lie with that. And then he was like, what'd you do before home inspections? I was like, this is all I've ever done. I was like, what'd you do before you were building? And he was like a math, he was a math teacher. Nice. You know? Yeah, I'm a math teacher and now you're building houses. You know, I hate it when they like go, well, have you ever built a house? Be like, no, I don't need to, but I know how to read a manual, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think that a lot of times um, home inspectors traditionally have gotten this bad rap of giving out opinions or sort of unsubstantiated commentary. Yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, he just sort of pulled that out of his butt. And it's like, we have built our entire company and I wholly encourage you listeners to base your commentary in what I call primary source documentation, which is basically the code, manufacturer's you know, uh, specifications, or like industry cutting edge leading experts who are smarter than all of us, you know, who are commenting on X, Y, and Z things. So you know, don't have your commentary just be something you made up. Don't use language that you're just making up. Base it in something, and that way it's indisputable. I completely agree with that. Yeah, don't don't base it upon opinion. Base it upon fact or written documentation of some sort. So it's not like, 
oh, you need a piece of flashing here because I think it's a good idea. Be like, no, you need a piece of flashing here because on the Hardy Manufacturer website, on this diagram, on this picture, it shows that you need it and it's required yeah. in writing. You know, and you've got to go back to these silly things. You've got to go back to the code. You've got to go back to the manufacturer's specs over and over and over. I've been in this business enough to have read those manuals a ton of times. And I still got to go back because you forget the nuance or it changes. The newest Hardy manual, the newest release that came out in December of 19 or November of 19, yeah. changes the way they discuss backflashing behind butt joints, which I actually think is better. But they change these things all the frigging time. So you got to stay up on it, you know, you're because you could be wrong. You're talking about the Hardy board, right? The Hardy oh, yeah. plank, the Hardy oh, yeah. plank. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. We just looked that up too, the Hardy plank, and we're like, that can't be right. Yeah, you're allowed to butt them up next to each other, and you don't need the flashing in between them. Or you're yeah. allowed that one or eighth inch gap. In moderate con uh, moderate contact, I believe, is the phrase, which is totally uh, undefinable what that means. Uh, yeah, I we saw that we're like that has to be wrong, but we didn't just call it wrong. You know what we did is we went back to the manufacturer to prove that it was wrong, and it was right there, brand new. And I was like holy cow like <laughs> you know we are down a pretty nerdy rabbit hole here however yeah. i do think that back flashing is king and that yeah. the only reason the hardy is doing that is so that there's not a great uprising amongst their installers because okay. they hate to do back flashing because it's this extra step they just can't go bang 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 yeah yeah all right so did you want to talk about your stucco experience or do you want to just move into it well i'll, I'll just say this um <clears throat> I mostly don't deal with traditional hard coat stucco. We mostly see stone veneer, which yeah. basically for any of you that have heard a presentation that I've given or anything Mark Parley's talked about, um, stucco with sprinkles or lumpy stucco is probably a better term for stone veneer because effectively the stones themselves are concrete and the mortar bed is concrete. So it's basically just stucco on your wall. We see a lot more of that in our area. It's not just stone veneer, it's a heared stone veneer. You gotta a say it right. Manufactured stone veneer, that's right. <laughs> AMSV, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so we see a lot of that. And the other day we, we called out our usual uh, sort of litany of, of problems on a stone veneer job on a home inspection. And the client uh, came back, was asking all sorts of questions. The seller was pushing back and saying, my builder said it was installed right. And I just was like, all right, it's really simple. You know, these are the reasons why. And so they said, okay, okay, we'll fix it. So they fix it, quote unquote, and then they say, can you come out and do a, um, a repair inspection? And I was like, huh, that's funny. Uh, we didn't get called to do the invasive uh, test. So no one uh, that I know knows if there's water damage behind there. So I'm really curious to know what they fixed. They just shoved mortar between the stones and it was done by a handyman. And they were like, literally, they believed that this was going to be okay. And it, it just is a continued illustration that sometimes in the home inspection industry, you might be made to think that you're stupid because everyone else around you is saying something else. And you got to know what you know. You got to stand your ground. You got to support yourself with documentation and forge ahead. And it's tough. It's tough to stand your ground sometimes in the face. Honestly, that's actually what just happened with me with the stucco job. Yeah. Because the builder was calling me wrong. His installer was calling me wrong. And then the, uh, um, and the client started to believe them. And so I called Mark, I got him on FaceTime and nice. awesome. He, he's a cool dude, man. He, he, he went on FaceTime, he helped me out. And then also I called two of my stucco contractors and I sent them all the photos and they're like, no, that's way wrong. It's wrong. Totally. So I was just like, you have to surround yourself by people that, um, that will help you build the stucco or, you know, inspection business. So it's not just you being able to come up with your own opinion because you're right people will make you feel like you don't know what you're talking about but you're like no and i just walked five houses down or something like that that was like a house was three years old and the same type of decorative piece and the stucco was stained all completely underneath yeah. it yeah and the caulking was all separated i just took a few photos of that and i was like this is what your house is going to look like in three years. And you know, I, I wonder if that's like, uh, that happens to other guys. Like I'll be in, um, we'll be inspecting one house on the left and then I'll see another one on the right and it's got the same problems. I'm like, well, we're not inspecting that one. Should I like leave a note, you know, like, or something <laughs> like that? Call yeah. us, you know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, no, I'll, I'll throw, let me throw a call out there. If any listeners are coming up against stone veneer and you have questions you know me, you may not know me, but you know me through this podcast. Call me up, Michael Conrad, look for me on Facebook or whatever. Call me up, I'd be happy to answer questions. 
There you go. Yeah. And, and also if you join uh, the home inspection whisperer group in there, we just talk about business so much. Uh, it's mainly business, but I'm sure you could ask some sort of stone question there and be just fine. Moving on into the show. I started this pros and cons list and actually I'm going to shout out to the, the listeners too, as well. This will be posted on the YouTube channel as, and I want you to go in there and drop your pros and cons in the comments mm. uh, because you know, I, I just quickly wrote down all the cons and I didn't get very far into the pros. I got cut down short a little bit, but I'm, there are some pros in the cons. That's what Michael and I were talking about. Totally. And my first con, which I think is the biggest con of them all, is how litigious this inspection mm -hmm. business is. Like you can easily be sued and the liability is real high. And I think that is like the ultimate con of being a home inspector. What do you think? Yeah, that, I think you're right. That probably vies for number one. I, I had a really uh, impacting moment early on in my business, uh, probably first couple months, where I was calling around some other inspectors to try to like, I don't know, ask some questions. And I got a guy on the phone who said, yeah, I'm not in business anymore. I was only in business for nine months and I got sued and it cost me multiple thousands of dollars. And I was like, screw this, I'm out. And he sounded like a young guy. I don't know how young he was, but I was young and he sounded young. And I was like, oh, frick, I think I'm betting on the wrong pony here. I think I've chosen the wrong thing. Like, maybe I shouldn't do this. So, yeah. And I can tell you guys out there listening, I have been sued and I have been through suits and I have settled suits. And unfortunately, it's terrible. It's terrible. And I feel like I have gotten done pretty well for considering how terrible it's been. I've never had to deal with a six figure problem, but they exist. Oh no. man, they exist. And uh, your insurance is really not interested in helping you out. They're really interested in not paying their money out to anyone. And they're really going to try to screw you if possible and don't think about anything different. So yeah, I think that's a good number one. You can get sued really easy in this business. I don't want to beat up in the insurance companies too much. My insurance seems to be taking care of me. I've been sued. Uh, well and then um and then i'm on i'm in one right now and they're not giving me two i mean you have to stay on them right you know but their whole end goal is to settle if that's what you mean not to really make it go you know win settling is winning for them you know what i mean it's not take it yes. all the way to court and finish it but they they actually create and if you haven't encountered this i'm glad um but they create a system where you're screwed from the beginning and here's what it is and it's every insurance company if you don't report all of the potential problems that are coming you know, to light, then they can disclaim you and not pay out because you failed to disclose the information about the potential suit. They have a whole clause about that. However, if you do disclose every single little complaint because you're sort of following the request of the insurance company, they will drop you because you seem too risky. And uh, so you're in a bit of a catch 22, a bit of a gambit because um, I know people who have been dropped because they were like, well, the insurance company told me to notify them. So I did. And then the insurance company was like, whoa, you get a lot of complaints and you're too risky. Peace. And then I personally have been disclaimed by the insurance company when I failed to disclose, which wasn't really as black and white as it sounds, but that's the loophole that they use. So might tip my hat to you, Chris. You must have the must send them the right Christmas cards or the right Christmas gifts because, <laughs> um, man, that's a, that's a real thing. Maybe paid them enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's probably that's probably the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, so if you get into this business, yes, there's inspectors out there who'd be like, oh, I've never been sued. You know, it's been perfectly fine. But you know, it's just maybe they're lucky. You know, and especially if you're a solo man operator, the chances of you being sued is a lot less, of course, because of volume reasons. But if you're in it long enough, eventually someone will sue you. And one of the things that one of my inspector friends in this area, he told me, he was like, you know, whenever you do a home inspection, you have to think about it like you're selling someone four years of insurance. We're not actually selling them four years of insurance. It's wow. like he's saying that because there's a four year window where they can sue you after you do the inspection. So it's like, well, that's just in Texas. They can sue us forever in Tennessee. So we're the idiots over here. <laughs> that's another con you know that's another con don't live yes. in tennessee if you're going to be a home inspector no yeah. but you're actually right about the volume i did this math a while back because I, as we started to grow in size i feel like we were do, getting a lot more complaints a lot more you know potential suits 
Um, and I was like really asking why. And I'd heard those same stories from those older inspectors at the conferences. Oh, I've never been sued, blah, blah. So I started doing the math. It is my estimation that somewhere between three and 4,000 inspections on the average, you can expect a suit. And I think a good uh, phrase for anyone listening who's new to the business, a good phrase for you to keep in your mind is, it is not a matter of if you get sued, it is a matter of when you get sued. Correct. This is a business, you will get some shrapnel. It's going to happen. And if you're a solo operator, you're in the best position because you're controlling your brand the best. You know what you're doing. Obviously, there's no room to hide if you did something wrong. But your volume potentially is at a level where you're not going to see suits all the time. It's going to be many, many years between, if at all. However, if you're doing 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 inspections a year, like maybe Chris and I are doing, you're going to start to see things happen in an almost annual basis. Yeah. Somebody will at least threaten you, at least. You oh, know, yeah. it just takes time. And so, all right, we can kind of end it there. It's just one thing is, is if you do get sued with that con, just remember when I first got it, I took it at like as a, a personal insult. Mm. And to me, now I'm just like, eh, it's just business. Do your best. You know, like that, they're, the other guy that's suing you, suing me, I think he actually thinks of it just as business too. He's just like, he's like, eh, the insurance companies will pay it if they, if I win, but if not, I'm just out a few thousand dollars. You know, that's literally, I'm sure that's what he thinks. That's yeah. terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. That's so it's terrible. Just, it's just business. Don't take it as a personal insult. No, but happens. you're right. You can't take it personal or it's really going to give you an ulcer. Yeah. All right. So my next con is you can die. You can die wow. doing your job. That's yeah. not number one. I feel like that should be number one. I didn't know that was coming. Uh, well, I guess you're right. That that probably should be in front of <laughs> I love how you can die is literally number two on your list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think being sued sometimes is worse than dying. Because there you go. That's what you're in fact saying, everyone. <laughs> because if you're dead, you don't have to worry about the lawsuit, right? I mean, you guess you can die in almost any job. I mean, you can die in your car. So I don't know. Yeah, but it is a con. You can die. So like there's a story of a guy out here in Texas where he just he touched a condenser lights out, you know, so it was, it was just charged. Yeah. And so that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, you know, or you can touch a panel box, you know, you fall off a roof, you know, you crawl through a crawl space where the water is in there and it's, it's charged. You, you can, uh, you can die. Wow. Yeah. That is definitely a con. Um, so anyone who doesn't want to die, basically, I guess you shouldn't become a home inspector. So um. <laughs> there, There's ways around it. I mean, like, obviously, you be safe. You carry your voltage sniffer. You know, you don't crawl on roofs that you're not supposed to I mean, climb on roofs that you're not supposed to climb on. I'm but sort of the, envisioning you taping, like, the voltage sniffer to your fingers so that, like, wherever you're reaching out, you're always sort of sniffing and sensing. Yeah, why okay. not? Just leave it on. <laughs> just leave it on around your it's neck amazing. and just hang hangs Ooh, around your neck. There's an invention. There's an invention, gloves that have a non-contact voltage detector in the tips of the fingers. Oh, that's a great idea. That could work, yeah. Yeah, just- uh, you, Nobody you steal just, that idea. You just start working on it. Start okay. working on it. Uh, so yeah, so just be careful out there. You know, if you do want to get into this, that you just have to realize that safety really does come into play. And mm -hmm. for the most part, as a solo man operator, you're by yourself, you know? So like if you fall or you touch something you're not supposed to touch or you crawl somewhere you're not supposed to crawl, no one's coming for a, a minute, you know? Yeah. So uh, another con for me is you, what I think is actually, it's kind of minute, but it's you get really dirty in this job, you know, like, and, but also you're still expected to stay clean at the same time. And I, and that always bothered me a little bit because you're like, Oh, I need you to crawl underneath your house, but you can't track any dirt inside my house, you know, or you have to climb around the attic, your hands get all dirty, but you can't touch any of my light switches that are perfectly white. And that's always bothered me a little bit. You know, obviously I take the actions, but that is a con, you know, you're, you're dirt, you're, it's a dirty job, but also you're expected to stay clean the entire time. You need like that film layer, like your whole body's covered in like a plastic and then you just peel off the plastic layer and you go. I yeah. guess that's what a Tyvek suit is. So there you go. Is that, is that your next invention too? That's my other next invention. There you go. <laughs> yeah. No, but that, that's a good point. I, I think that some people are more accustomed to say an office job or a job where you're not sweating a lot. I know that down in Texas, certainly here in Tennessee, you go into an attic 
in the summertime, like you're coming out with a drenched shirt, go to your truck, get a different shirt situation. So, I mean, this job does carry some dirtiness to it. You got to be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. So you do have to be okay with it. See, I enjoy the heat. I enjoy climbing. I enjoy, you know, crawling through the crawl spaces. So that's a pro for me, but also for someone that is getting into this and, you know, you have to be expected to climb on steep roofs, crawl through crawl spaces, be okay with dogs, be okay with mm-hmm. rodents, be okay with snakes and spiders. And you dead know, things. And dead things. Oh yeah, the dead things in the mm-hmm. in the attics and the crawl. Man, there's man, I saw one dead thing in the attic the other day and it was like it was intense. It was it was intense. Was it was mummified? Like, yeah, kinda. Yeah. It was like, I think it used to be a raccoon, you know. Oh gosh. It, I don't know. It was it was pretty hideous, but it's like something that could like haunt your dreams, I guess. I got scared. Uh, I scared myself one time in a crawl space with a cat that was very leathery and dried out. And it was one of those, I turned the corner around a column and it sort of startled me. Oof, out of some heart palpitations. Um, but this is another good one. I, I feel like there is a gross factor or like a dirty sort of, uh, I got to have an iron stomach factor in this that, you know, if you you know, aren't going to be that good with a dead thing or a gross thing or being a dirty thing, this might be a tough bid. Yeah. 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 So it is a a con and a pro. I'd say it goes both ways. If you're okay with that stuff, whatever, you know, or you like seeing that stuff. I enjoyed seeing the dead raccoon. I'm like, I'm like, that's kind of cool, you know, like, but if you're not, don't like that, then that is definitely a con. You, you'd be, you, some people would have thrown up. <laughs> That's weird. I'm going to give you a little weird sticker for that one. And we're going to see how many weird stickers we give out during this podcast. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I guess the, uh, the next con for me would be, a, it could take forever to start out. You know, like you're starting this business out and it could take close to a year and a half before you're even really rolling into this business and then it can take also when you first start out not only would it take a few hours to do the home inspection you go home for a few hours to write your report too as well so it's not like a a perfect system whenever you first join you know i'm glad you brought this one up so this is my number one my number one is that from the time you decide you want to do this to the time you have some sort of regularity and profitability First of all, it's not guaranteed at all. Failure is common. And so, uh, but as opposed to other businesses where you maybe get in it, like what is the length of time between starting and achieving some sort of normalcy? You know, I'm making money. I know what my schedule is, you know, some sort of relative normalcy, that length of time. I would say that not wholly unlike the stock market, for those that think they can really figure out the stock market, you can know all the right factors. You can be professional. You can you know, put a lot of energy and even put a lot of money into the on-ramp time. But there is a luck factor and there's a difficulty pressure that's always pushing against you that makes it really hard to sort of figure out how long is it going to take me to get to normal, to get to be profitable, to get to be successful, whatever that looks like to you. And so this is a tough one because I've talked to people who are interested in getting the inspection business. And they're like, well, how long do you think it's going to take before I can expect to have this many number of inspections per week or this many number of inspections per year or this amount of money I want to make? And I'm like, dude, I don't know because the market matters. Like the way you present yourself matters. Like what area you focus your marketing efforts matters like what services you do and do not offer matter i mean the list goes on and on so the the on-ramp can be really difficult and really long who's the lady that works for uh ruben and she's really smart she has that uh degree in uh Tessa. Building science. I'm going to tell Tessa that you called her a lady. I'm interested to see if she thinks that's old and dowdy or or not. I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I call I call the women that are around me, and if I call them lady, that means I respect them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, then I, I will tell her that. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, Tessa. Tessa. So one thing I remember asking mm. her a question, and I know this isn't related to the question I asked, but her answer was, "It all depends," you know. And I was like, and so you're right. There is a luck factor in there. Whenever I first started, I met a a real estate agent that liked me and liked my reports and they ended up giving me like 30 or 40 that year, Mm -hmm. you know, my first year and I did 155 jobs. So, you know, that's actually like a huge percentage of my workflow whenever I first started. I mean, she had a brokerage, but still, 
I had brokers, I was like their go-to for a while because they could call me and I mean, they would get it that day or the next day for a while. I, that answer kind of always stuck with me because I'm like, you're right. It always, it just depends. It just depends. Yeah. So when you, when you start out, it depends on how hard you work, how you present yourself, you know, what your end product looks like. If it's sloppy and they're not, you're, they won't use you anymore. You know? Yeah, I will say, well, the luck factor is big. I would say the effort factor is bigger. So if you really are working on your reporting style and your appearance and your brand logo and how many times you're going out and meeting people and how much effort you're putting into sort of marketing and starting the business, that's going to pay off in spades. I mean, it it really is. And so um, the luck is a big one. I remember I got, and I'll just call it, I got lucky. I started at a really good time. I started just after the crash Mm -hmm. at a time where Nashville and the Tennessee market was really sort of on the uptick. And so I, I tell people I rode the wave, you know, there was a wave and I rode it. You know, that falls into the factor too. I don't like to 100% believe in luck. I believe you create your own luck. You know, you Mm, could just say, well, that was going on whenever I was going on, but also you put effort in somewhere else where you help create that luck. The luck is kind of there, but you help push it along, if that makes sense. Well, I suppose maybe my commentary on luck really has to do with the guys out there or the girls out there that are getting into the business that are saying, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing mm-hmm. the things that I think I'm supposed to be doing. Heck, I'm following the inspector whisper, you know, rubric of what exactly I should be doing. And it's not working for me. All I can say is, you know, you got to keep beating it and keep going forward and keep pushing, keep pushing because there is a luck factor, but you can push through it. I'm telling you, if you follow the home inspection whisper oh. rubric, what you're saying, it will work. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. It's, pro- it's proven science. Wow. I- <laughs> It's that is amazing. Yeah, you heard it so, here, folks. Yeah. So uh, the next one was me. Was there's a lot of paperwork involved. You know, you you have agreements. You have you know, you have contracts. You have emails. You have your report writing software. So you have to be somewhat okay with a lot of it. Can be automated, and it does, and it can be taken time. But whenever you're first setting up, you need to make sure all that pa- insurance. But you got to make sure all that paperwork is set up correctly because if not like it kind of leads back into the first thing the first con that we had was liability you know if your paperwork's not right i'm telling you they'll look for the smallest finest detail in that agreement and then be like nope right here it says and then they'll just pick you apart or even in your reports you say something slightly wrong or there's a slightly misspelled word or something Or you used a, what I like to say, adverb. You say minor, you know, a minor uh, mortar crack or something like that. And that minor mortar crack let a bunch of water in and it, and it caused some major damage. And you, and so, yeah, there's a lot of paperwork and you got to really pay attention of what you're saying. You do know that uh, it's an adjective, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know that because I'm a, I'm an English major. There you you go. Yeah. (laughs) No, but you're right. I, I think that um, you could almost lump this into a bigger box of like, um, this is a, a business that is deceptively detailed. You have to actually carry and manage a lot of details. And it's really, it kind of doesn't look like that from the outside. It kind of looks like, oh, I'm going to walk around a house and use the fact that I've been in construction. And I'm going to tell people about it. But it ends up being sort of like, really absurdly detailed sometimes where people are picking apart little words and that can be um, that can be a tough bid because you feel like you put yourself into it you feel like you did a good job on site you feel like you're trying to help someone out and they're sort of really getting after you all right so moving on uh the next one is could, could be a con or a pro because i actually enjoy being by the phone all the time but you actually always always have to be by your phone you know, especially when you first start out, you could be eating dinner with your family, you know, or at a family event or shoot, even in church, you know, I don't know what you're doing on your free time, but like you always have to be by your phone. And if you don't answer it, that person's going to move on to the next phone. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought this one up. This is my number two. Um, I called it your time is not your own, at least in the beginning. Um, there is an interesting sort of, um, I don't know, maybe a mirage or some sort of illusion When you look at the inspection industry or becoming home inspector from the outside looking in, you have this idea of like, oh my gosh, like 
it's pure freedom. I just run my own business and run my own schedule and I'll get to do whatever I want whenever. And I had learned fast and was basically a slave to someone else's phone call and someone else's time for a lot of years. Your time is not your own. And if you want to grow a business, it can be very proportional to the amount of willingness that you have to answer your phone at 1145 at night or to, you know, take that extra inspection on the weekend, even though you don't do weekends or, you know, whatever it is, compromise whatever sort of ideas that you had, you know, prior to that. Your time is really not your own, not for a number of years. Whether you are a sole proprietor the whole time or whether you become a larger company, your time is really not your own for the first, I don't know, three, four, five years. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, well, some people forever, depending on how you manage your phones, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, you just you got to really be by the phone all the time. And that kind of leads into the next one about time, especially in the real estate market, depending on how you market. I've gotten it kind of down to a science of where it's pretty steady throughout the entire year. But if you are just a solo man operator and you're not marketing consistently and you're just doing jobs, the market is actually unpredictable. You know, you have busy seasons, you have slow seasons, you have busier seasons. So like it goes up and down, right? If you're not, if you don't have a very consistent marketing path that you're on. Yeah. I would say that, um, <clears throat> that ties into one of the others on my list. A, a con is that there is more business acumen, you know, knowledge, you know, required of you in the home inspection business than you initially think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe we can sort of blame if we're going to blame someone, maybe blame some of the larger associations or maybe blame the schools a little bit. But it feels like in general, a lot of home inspectors get into this business thinking to themselves, oh, well, the only path for me is to go into business for myself. When in reality, there's many other paths that you can take. And so what you learn when you do go into business for yourself is, oh my gosh, the actual inspecting part is kind of only part of it. I actually have to do a bunch of other things. And if you're not good at those things or not knowledgeable of that, or you didn't even realize that you have to keep marketing throughout the entire year, no matter how busy you are, like, that can be a real rude awakening and cause some real herky jerky parts of the business where you do the classic marketing, you know, roller coaster where you do a lot because you're not busy and then you get a lot of business. And so you do none and then you do no marketing. So then you are out of work and then you go do more marketing. And so it's up and down, up and down. And that can be a real, uh, for those of you that out there that like a, a regular paycheck, that can be a, a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, it's a yeah. What well, in the Buffini? I follow Buffini, and that's called peaks and valleys. Mm. You know, you market whenever it's not good, and you stop marketing when it's good, and then it gets not good again, and you start marketing. So instead, you got to remember to consistently market. And to kind of cap off of what you said right there too, you're like it's not just a technician job. It's it's not. You're a you are an advertiser now. You're an HR department. You're an accountant. You're a you're a salesman and a technician. So it's not just one job whenever you're a home inspector. It's like five. So it's yeah, I, that's a con, I think, because most of the jobs that you go for out there in the world, you know, they're fairly defined, you know, like I'm going to do X. But this isn't really just a job. You know, it's like a whole ball of wax. It's a whole business. And so if you're going to go into business for yourself, with big aspirations or just regular size aspirations, like you're going into business, not going into job. Yeah, not home thing. inspections. It's not just home inspections. It's a, yeah. it's a little bit of, of a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of leads into the next thing. Wow, somehow I built this in linear path. I don't know so how that amazing. happened. You're uh, great. You, you, must have been, you must be impressed right now. I'm so <laughs> impressed. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, it's not a get rich quick scheme, you know? And whenever you first see it, I know a lot of people are like, they see a home inspector do a job. They're like, they're like, it's, they're like, this is five hundred dollars. They're like, how many do you do a day? And they see, oh, they're like, oh, you do two a day? That's a thousand dollars. And they start like doing math on their fingers, and they're like, this guy's rich, you know, like, and it and it and it's really not like that, you know. <laughs> it's it's not a get rich quick scheme. Yes, you can make some pretty good money in it. But it takes a long time to get there. I'd say, as I had said this a few times, it's taken, it took me several years to get to a point where I was actually making okay money. Yeah, it's, it's a tough call because um, 
people do that napkin math and it really starts to take them on a little mental journey. They're like, oh, $1,000 a day, 365 days. You can make $365,000 a year. And you got to walk that back. You got to have your feet on the ground. And so the money and the sad reality is um, the majority of home inspectors out there are not making great money. They're making average money, which is good too. You know, it, it's, it's a, again, proportional to some element of luck, some element of effort, but no, it is not going to be just rolling in the cash. And the truth is, I think there's actually a lot of real estate agents that get into that for that exact same reason. Um, and I think that a lot of them are faced with the harsh reality that it's also not a get rich quick scheme. Although I think they're overpaid, but that's sort of a potentially a side note. Well, I'd say in a, uh, but on that side note, I'd say in our lifetime, that will be changed. It'll, oh yeah. It'll be oh, changed. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to kind of move into the pros list, but do you have any cons that you wanted to throw in there before you move? No, we, we sort of, we sort of hit the ones I was looking at. Yeah. Okay. So moving into the pros, uh, this was actually given to me by one of my, uh, home inspector friends here and it's at home inspecting. Even if you don't stay in home inspecting, it's actually a great start to get into the real estate business. And so like, if you get into the real estate business, if you even start with home inspecting and say you didn't like it and you wanted to go into flipping homes or the contracting side, or even become a real estate agent, home inspecting is actually a great place to start because you know what's in the hood of the car, if that makes sense. Totally. I love this. And this is so huge. I, I can't, you know, underscore this point enough. This is actually a great launching off skill set and a great launching off point for a lot of things. Because mm -hmm. the truth is, if you begin to understand the built environment, construction science, like you could go into the trades, you could right. go into the real estate side of this world. Because of our foot into both worlds, one part construction, one part real estate, um, you really start to see how transactions happen, how houses get built wrong. I know that I came up in a construction household. My father was a contractor and I learned a bunch of things wrong. You know, and I didn't know that until I got into home inspection. Um, so yeah, it's a great launching off point. And honestly, if you are even mildly good at the, uh, the business side of it, it can actually be a great launching off point for other types of business. You might find that, oh, I actually like the business side of home inspections more than I like the technician side. So now that I figured out and got my feet wet in this sort of, you know, entrepreneur environment, I'm going to go and do something different. I actually know a handful of um, home inspectors that are no longer home inspectors, but are in business now because they sort of figured out becoming a sole owner operator that they like the business side more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't even have to be in the trade industry, but you're right. But like, it, if you become a great home inspector, then you can work for builders, you know, actually be a really great builder or even create a different business. Like you said, you know, I really enjoy the business side of stuff. So every time I look at businesses, I, it's not even in the trade. If I'm looking to move, you know, you can figure it out and ha apply the same tactic of us successfully running our businesses. You could put it somewhere else too, as well. Totally. Yeah, this business forces you to become good with customer service and with like putting yourself out there, like, you know, marketing and, and some sales. And I think that those are skills that are just essential in today's day and age. So if you get into this business, you're going to end up with a skill set that'll take you to many other places. I have a couple employees that no longer work for me, but have launched themselves from being sort of a, a lower earning potential. They came into my company, spent a couple of years with me, and now they have sort of launched themselves into other states and other businesses and other places in the world and are doing very well. And I'd like to think at least it's in part from the experience they got of being a home inspector with us. Nice. Yeah. So moving on to the next one of pros, you eventually, over a period of time, you do get to control your own schedule. So if even as a solo man operator, you know, you're out there. And even though you're by the phone and not whatnot all the time, say you have a steady source of business, it's always coming in, your schedule's full. It's okay for you to take a week off because you know that'll be there. It might be a little bumpy coming back, but the business will still be there and you can control your own schedule. Yeah, I'd say that um, one of the indicators that you're probably ready 
to start putting some blocks in your schedule or, or, you know, or not just jumping when everyone else says jump. One of the indicators is a pretty consistent annual work with little to no change seasonally. If you right. are a single owner operator and you're doing pretty consistent work throughout the year with little to no change seasonally, you're probably at an over demand and under capacity, which is pretty common meaning you don't have as much to give, but people want your services more. So you can change your prices and or start taking some additional weekends off or time off your schedule. You can control your time. Heck, you might even start to say, look, I don't take calls after six. You know, whatever it is, you can start to lay rules down. But bec because your demand is so big, some people will fall away because they think you're being difficult when in reality you're just being regular. And they'll fall away, but you'll still have a full plate. So something to keep an eye on for yourself if you're looking for that freedom. Yeah. All right. And then the next one, I put this one in myself. And I felt like whenever I became a home inspector, it took a minute, but you join like a community, you know, a community of real estate professionals, not just home inspectors, but real estate agents, you know, plumbers, electricians, and you join this community and I enjoy the community, even though some of the other guys are not the best people to hang out with or be around, but you know, it's like that in any community, right? And I, I feel like you are part of a community uh, as a home inspector. Yeah, I, I love that part. Um, I find that now in the way my business runs, I'm not connected to that community as locally as much. I'm probably more connected to the inspector national community, which has its own really positive um, benefits as well of meeting people across the world, across the nation, um, learning from them, seeing how other people live in other, pe other places. So uh, that brotherhood or even sort of just community locally is um, something that you you maybe are not going to get in a lot of other businesses or at least in a lot of other jobs. This one puts you into a place where there's lots of entrepreneurs who are looking for connection. And so you all band together. Right. Yeah. And figure out better ways to handle things. And, you know, we, you and I ask each other for opinions all the time, you know, with that kind of stuff. So I feel like joining community and the next pro that I have in here and that actually falls into that a little bit is you're actually helping people, you know, whenever you're a home inspector, you're really helping people make one of the most important decisions in their life or one of the most expensive decisions whenever they're purchasing a home. You know, this home could either send them in a spiraling chaos of debt, you know, or they understand that the money that they're about to spend is okay. You know, so you're, you're helping people. So sort of tangential to that, one of the things that I remember thinking about when I got in this business was, I was coming out I was coming out of the recession time and I was trying to figure out I wanted to sell or be in a business I wanted to sell something where people wanted it cuz I had previously been in a business where people only sort of wanted it and I was having to convince them a lot and I wanted people to come to me or for them to sort of say yes when I was saying do you want this you know and so this concept of being needed being an integral part of the fabric of people's sort of lives, I, that's a big one. I, I still love wearing this big sort of ethical badge of like, look, like essentially at the core, I'm helping people. I'm helping them either answer the questions that they couldn't get answered, know the information they couldn't know themselves, avoid problems that they might have fallen into. Like you end up being really helpful. And honestly, it's a little sad that we probably don't get more uh, praise or uh, award ceremonies for uh, the good work that we do. But, you know, honestly, it, it is a really good positive feeling that even after our long day's work or a tough bid, like there's a lot of clients who are probably behind you that are really happy with what you've done for them. Yeah. And honestly, it kind of falls back to the story whenever I first started about that stucco and how that builder did it wrong. And I really am helping that lady so she didn't have to rip down her wall in four or five years to build a new one. So I, I don't need a praise or anything like that or medals. I just like the fact that I'm like, I do. Hey, <laughs> oh, you need some praise and medals? I'll send you one after this uh, episode okay, cool. and uh, you, yeah. get a, you, get a, you get a badge for uh, a participation badge. That's what Beep. you're going <laughs> to... Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, I would say here's another indicator for anyone listening. If people are constantly coming to you 
and they're thanking you for helping them avoid this or understand this, like you're on the right path. Because, you know, when you're really just doing more than observing and reporting, like you're becoming that sort of that human connection that people I think are really looking for. Yeah. And uh, so moving on to the next one is uh, there's actually not much of an age discrimination when it comes into home inspections. There's a little bit, but you can actually be fairly young and old and still do this job. You might, if you're younger, you still might have to prove that you know what you're talking about. But if you're older, you actually have to prove that you're going to get on the roof, you know? So there's still some proof that you have to be there, but age discrimination doesn't exist in this industry as much as it does somewhere else. And I actually kind of like that. And it was kind of brought up. You're like, you can do this job for a very long time, you know, for a very long time. Yeah. Sort of, I guess another way to say that might be uh, this job can be flexible with the way your life changes, or this job can take you beyond a traditional point of retirement if you want. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I think there's a lot of flexibility with when you enter in or how long you want to be in it. Yeah, because we, you know, I have two inspectors in their 60s here and they enjoy it. You know, one does just one a day and that fits his lifestyle. You know, it's really good for him. It's good side money. He's already double retired, you know, so like this is just even a little bit extra cash. I think he donates most of it, you know, and then and then I have someone that's really young. I think he's 25, you know, and so uh, there's a big window of where you can be a successful home inspector no matter what age you are. Yeah, I, I, I do like that. I felt like this had a relatively low barrier to entry if you could provide the proof, as you said. <laughs> Yes. You have to prove, prove, provide the proof. You know what you're doing. You know? Yes. Yeah. Um, the a pro too, this is actually some, a con to some people, but I actually driving, I actually enjoy driving a lot. And uh, I listen to my books, you know, my coaching books, or even, you know, I listen to music and stuff. And the time, the reason why it's four of a pro is because whenever you're driving, you're actually driving most of the time, except on the way home during off hours. So you're not stuck in traffic during the morning or in the afternoon. It's just normally whenever you're coming home. So I would say most people probably call that a con. I think it's interesting that it's in your pro category because windshield time is probably not most people's favorite thing, but you're right. There is a lot of it. And depending on who you are, I suppose it can be a pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, but it's mainly that the main reason why it's a pro, because most of the time you have to drive to work, right? Most people do. And whenever you're driving, it's in the off hours of driving. So you're not driving in the morning during that 6 a.m. rush hour traffic. You're, you're driving either at nine or eight o'clock or you know, depending on whenever you get to the, the job. Yeah, I think that um, sort of the part of that that I connect to is um, I got to know my city and I got to see a lot of things. You know, sometimes um, I like to just know where I'm at or, you know, know all parts of it. And so I think that a silly little pro for me was I got to know a lot of my area and I got to see a lot of things. I didn't, I didn't write this one down, but I really should have is I know where there's a, where I'm at in the city. Most of the time I know where there's a hole in the wall Mexican food place that I can go to. So that's definitely a pro. I love Mexican food and I can normally find one and a very small radius in my lunch break. So this is a uh, Inspection Whisper theme. I, uh, in your other podcast, I know you, lo- you t- love to talk about Mexican food. I also appreciate uh, some good Mexican food, particularly a good breakfast burrito. Mm. Um, I don't know if you have that down in your neck of the woods, but <laughs> yeah, a pro for me on this, um, and it's a bit of a nerdy pro, but we'll sort of put it in the nerdy category is, um, I was someone who always enjoyed learning and I have a curious mind. Um, I tend to think that a curious mind or a lifelong learner, it makes an excellent inspector. Um, But I get to learn new things every day. I get to go down weird rabbit holes into sort of esoteric information. And the other side of the learning and the sort of research is the investigation side. I love the investigation side, whether it's just doing a regular home inspection, being able to see just how homes are put together or like something historic or even just a weird defect in a new home. Like 
all of that stuff I find interesting, you know? So if there is part of you that loves the, the chase of new information, like this is a big pro for me. And that, that goes into one of my bottom pros here, not bottom, but it's in my pro section is, <laughs> I don't know why I called it the bottom pro, but bottom. it's a, it's like I'm a detective and yeah. every house is different and it's just a batter. Or, you know, I feel like whenever you're a new inspector or whenever I was a new inspector, you, you kind of laser focus on like one item and I forget which teacher it was, but it was at an ASHI conference and he was talking about building science and, you know, and then he talked about the property as a whole and how it all operates together and it's a system. And that kind of just blew my mind. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm a detective. So this problem leads to another problem and I have to figure out where this is going. And I feel like that after that ASHI conference, it really made me like realize you're not just in an individual problem basis. It's more of like you're a detective and you're trying to figure out the whole story about the property. Totally. Yeah. So. yeah I, I think that um, related to all of that for me, a big pro is there, it's different every day. I, I hear people in interviews talk about, oh, I, I don't want to be stuck in a chain to a desk. You know, I like, I like being out there and being something new every day. Well, this is the place, my friend, like new agent, new client, new problems, new weird personalities, new interesting things to find, new neighborhoods to explore. I mean, literally almost everything is new. Sure. You're going to always find the same sort of defects, you know, for your bottom half of defects. But the truth is it's new every day. I'm eight years in, almost nine years in. And it's like, it's still interesting every single day. No, I agree. Yeah. 100%. You're always learning something new. There's always a different material. There's always a different product. And you're like, you see a new product and you're like, I don't know what that is. I'm going to go figure it out, you know, and try to look, you take pictures of the name brand and you look it up the manufacturer. So you're never going to learn it, know it all, but you're right. Yeah. It's always just trying to learn something new and it's, and it is always new. It's, it, I it mean, really, some real nerd, some real nerd alert going on right here. Like I can just envision the two of us hanging out. We're like, Oh, check out this new manufacturer specifications manual, man. <laughs> but that's actually how the co- podcast started about the Hardy manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, oh, I was blown away by how they butted that up. All right, so, and then into the pros too, like I have in there where you, we did talk about this a little bit, but you were able to create real good work-life balance after you've been in it for a while. Mm. And uh, so we don't have to really beat up on that one too much, but uh, the money's good after a while too. You actually can live even as a solo man operator and not even busy solo man operator, just a solo man operator and have uh, it, it, you have to be good and start off with that. You have to have a good product and make pretty decent money in this industry. Yeah. I, I, uh, I've told people in the past, there's a holding your breath period in the beginning where you're not making good money. Your time is not your own. You're working like a dog. You know, you're, you're definitely uphill battle, but if you can sort of make it through those intervening years in the beginning, um, and I don't even know how many years that is. I've heard other sole proprietors say that, you know, it's approaching, you know, seven to 10 years. But like, if you can stay in it more than five years, I think you really can drop your expenses pretty low, write your own ticket, make your own schedule, pretty much arrange your work-life balance how you want and still come away making pretty good money. And it's obviously dependent on which part of the country, what metro you're in, all these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think you're right. Um, for me, I have to call it the obvious uh, elephant in the room here, Chris. The inspection industry has a pretty low barrier to entry considering you can build a big company pretty, if you put the effort in, pretty easily. There's There's not a lot of barriers to going from sole proprietor up. There's difficulty. It's not an easy process. But one big pro for me, particularly for you and I, is we were able to build a company much, much larger than ourselves with just the effort we put in. And so I think for a lot of people, if they're curious about getting into the business side or want to own a multi-inspector company, heck, starting a big business in any industry can be hard. And I think that the the inspection industry presents you a really good option and a really good path if you're willing to put the work in. You know, that, that kind of leads into one of the other inspector I talked to because I was helped him, he helped me build the pros and cons. You know, we ban- bantered back and forth. And one of the things he said is, is 
the barrier to entry to actually start your own business, uh, not even say a multi-inspector firm, but even to start your own business as a home inspector is low compared to everything else out there in the world. You want to be a plumber and you want to start that, you have to have thousands of dollars worth of tools, right? You want to be an electrician, it takes years to be a master electrician. You know, you want to be a contractor, you have to have enough money to build something first and hopefully you have the training behind it to do well flooring you have to have the inventory of the floor you know i could take this forever a home inspector you just need your brain a few yeah maybe two or three thousand dollars worth of tools to have everything you know and then you just start working right and yeah, so, so it's not it's not a retail or an inventory business, which where you have to hold a lot of money in inventory. So that's positive. It's a service oriented business. So if you have a body that works, your body, and you go out and help people, and you're not a complete robot or an idiot, like you can make money providing service. And you're right, you can start really modestly with a low amount of cost. However, I think that the biggest cost ends up becoming the hold your breath period. How long can you survive on, you know, peanuts until you can make it through? So the biggest cost should be, you know, just surviving, you know, basically, because there's not a lot of overhead costs in the beginning of starting. The costs will come. <laughs> Let me tell you, the costs will come. <laughs> um, but um, in the beginning, no, it, it can be a, a really smooth buried entry. And honestly, I'm not sure that's a pro 100% of the time because there are some folks in the industry that are maybe not supposed to be here. But um, no, but you're right. For those that are interested in putting in the work and have a good mind to do so, I'm glad for that. Yeah. All right. So one of my final pros that I've read out, written out is I get to buy a lot of tools. You know, toys. I like um, that. You know, some people like jet skis or fancy jewelry or whatever. Man, I'm all about the tools. If I'll. If I see a tool out there and it looks nice and I think it will help benefit the home inspection, I'll buy it. I mean, I'll have like $4,000 infrared cameras, you know, like, and uh, uh, Mark sold me his and it was, he sold that one to me for 4,000. But when he bought it, I looked up the price. It was 15,000 when it first, when he first bought it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I have zip levels, I have water levels, you know, moisture drones. meters, drones. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I have a whole pile of broken drones on my shelf over there. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, just buying uh, tools is like one of my favorite things in the totally in the whole. Yeah, if you're a world. if you're a gearhead, there's a lot of gear in this business that you can sort of sink your teeth into. Yeah, I think I have an episode. Remember whenever I went and saw Steve Reckner in Ohio, and he was oh, like, yeah, showing yeah. all the tools. He has. He, I'd say he, he has even more tools than I do. And oh, that's yeah. a He's lot. a real gearhead if you're listening, <laughs> yeah. Steve. Yeah. All right. Well, do you have any other pros in there you think? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, factors ultimately that sort of span the list. You know, um, the freedom of your time is not your own in the beginning and your own later. So it, it's a pro and it's a con. Um, the difficulty of starting um, is not always in your control. Um, but if you put in the effort, it can lead to a really sort of fruit bearing business. Um, I, I don't think I properly did a good pros and cons, uh, list when I first started in truth. I just knew that this was an area. If I wanted to talk and help people and I wanted to rely on my experience in construction, this was a great place to be. And I, I'm pretty sure that's about as all I did for pros and cons. Um, and I've definitely hit some of these cons pretty hard over the years, but I'm glad to say that most of them have turned pros um, or I've been able to, to sort of fall in and lean on the pros mostly. So yeah, it, it's, it's not for everyone. And I have met my fair share of folks out there that have said, it, it seems nice, but it's just not for me. And I think it's good that anyone listening, do some evaluation if you're fresh to the industry and, and really try to make your own pros and cons list. Feel free to reach out to us if you have questions, because um, it's hard to always figure it out on your own. Yeah. And if you do have any questions, make sure you drop in the Home Inspection Whisperer group on Facebook, because if you drop, you ask questions there, especially about business or even getting into it, it, we, you know, we're all open and we'll answer the questions super easily. So Chris, great episode. Where are we going to go next with this, how to start a home inspection business thing? You know, I have the Home Inspection Whisperer guidebook and I don't know if you've even purchased it because you're on the show. What I was going to do is I'm going to send it over to you and I figured we'd just start with chapter one and mark our way through it. And 
when it really comes into it is you have to set up your business legally first. So mm -hmm. I figured we would just start off with the basic steps you would need next to start the business. Yeah, that'd be great. Talk about business entities, the legalities of it, bank accounts, you know, just how to, how to get yourself right. Yeah, the, yeah, your LLC or you want your sole proprietor or, you know, your marketing material, man, even naming yourself. I, I, I saw this joke the other day. It was in a, a, one of the Facebook groups and it was like the guy named himself five star home inspections and he had four and a half stars. And I thought that was funny. <laughs> so, you know, you got to really think about what you name yourself or, you know, or you don't want to name yourself the perfect home home inspector, you know, because there's no such thing as a perfect home. You just just stuff like that, building a business. I figured we could kind of build off of that and go into there. Agreed. That sounds good. Well, thanks for having me on as always. Yeah. Nice to bring you back, uh, Michael. And we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk again shortly. And if y'all have any questions, please follow us on YouTube and drop in the comments there as well. And make sure you follow Michael Conrad too. Uh, what's the best way they can follow you? Yeah, you can Google me or you can look me up on Facebook. I have a uh, Facebook page called The Diligent Inspector. Um, you can like me there. We put out videos uh, a little bit less than Chris, but on occasion. And uh, you can also look up our company, Diligent in Nashville, Tennessee. Nice. Yeah. And uh, he, he really does help. He's, he participates in ASHI a lot too. So you can uh, look him up there as well and uh, catch us on the next episode. Thanks guys for listening and catch us on the next one. See ya. Later. Later.